I'm Stefano Forli, and I work in the same lab with uh, David and uh, Pradeep here that will help us during the, the practical part. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, build on top of what David just said, and I'm going to show you how you can use our tools for doing virtual screening, meaning that you have one target, or many forms of the target we'll see, and multiple receptors, uh, multiple ligands, sorry. So, first of all, what's a virtual screening? A virtual screening, uh, sorry, I'll give you the, this is the overview of what we're going to talk about. I'll give you the, the, the definition, what's the typical goal of a virtual screening, uh, the definition of the chemical space, that's where we're going to look for the answer, and uh, an, an extension of what David said about preparing the data that you're going to use for your calculation. So, first of all, what's a virtual screening? So, if you're looking for a compound that uh, uh, gives um, a given biological function, the way to find it is to do an experiment. So you take this compound, you put it in your target, either uh, in vitro or in vivo, depending on what, what your specific biological target is, and you do a screening. The problem is that if you start where, um, in, in cases where you have no inhibitors and you're starting from scratch, the only way to find compounds is to do a high throughput screening, meaning that you do the, the practical experiment, you try to do an inhibition assay, for, assay, for example, uh, with hundreds, thousands of, or hundred thousands of compounds. Uh, the problem with that is that it's very expensive, as you can imagine, uh, both in terms of money and time, because uh, testing thousands of compounds takes a lot, a lot of time. And um, it can be automated. There are processes to automate the actual experiments, but still it takes a lot of human intervention to prepare the samples and so on. And uh, not necessarily all the assays can be automated. And this is where the virtual part comes in. So the advantage of a High throughput virtual screening is that you try to simulate what's going to happen uh, in your particular system uh, in silico. It is cheap by definition because it saves money and time because of the, it is intrinsically automatable. It is designed to be automated. And um, the main goal of a virtual screening is to reduce the number of actual compounds you're going to test. So don't expect to run a virtual screening experiment and find the active compound that's going to give you the biological activity. What's happening is that you get, a, you prioritize your library of compounds to test, and if you're lucky and if you did things properly, uh, one or more active compounds can, can show up in your assay. So the definition of a virtual screening is a search for compounds with a defined biological activity using a computational model. Uh, it is a knowledge-based method. A virtual screening requires some prior knowledge, either on the ligands, so you have a bunch of ligands with a, a given biological activity, you can try to rationalize that and try to extract what are the essential chemical features that are responsible for this, this activity. Or it can be structure-based, that's docking, that's what we're going to uh, discuss today. So it requires pr prior knowledge about the three structure of your target. So what we want is actually, I'll do this more quickly, is a uh, Let's go one step at a time. Uh, in principle, the, the question seems fairly easy. What you want is something that binds to your target, that's your receptor, with a given uh, inhibition constant, with a given free energy. So uh, it seems like an easy task, right? The problem is that usually your target, especially if you're looking for a drug, is contained within cells. So you want something that doesn't kill the cell, so you want to get rid of uh, uh, exotic elements like uh, platinum, rubidium, uranium, and it's not a joke because there are libraries that contain uranium compounds. Uh, you want to get rid of reactive chemical uh, compounds with uh, reactive chemical groups because they will bind A specifically everywhere. Basically, they are toxic because they will, will stick to everything and it will kill your cells. You want to prevent, uh, you want to avoid compounds that are over functionalized. And the reason for that is because if you have too many hydrogen bond acceptor and donors, again, you can stick to everything. Same thing with uh, um, under-functionalized groups. If they are under-functionalized and maybe they are too lipophilic or uh, they have only one or two hydrogen bonds, the problem is that it is hard to achieve specificity. So if the requirement is just to have two hydrogen bonds somewhere, they can stick to pretty much every protein, and you don't want that. The other essential thing is that these compounds should have uh, very well-defined uh, physiochemical physical chemical properties, in particular the partition coefficient that is de uh, defined as a, the log p, that is essentially the ratio, it's something that can be measured experimentally or can be calculated uh, in silico, is the ratio of the partitioning of your compound in a solution that contains 
equal amounts of water and octanol. If you want to do that, one ligand, one receptor, you can definitely do that on a simple workstation. So your computer, you fire it, and you run the calculation. Although, what we're going to do in a virtual screening is usually handle hundreds of thousands of compounds uh, against the target. So this means that we need to calculate all the maps for all the possible ligand uh, um, atom types. And then you need to try all the possible combinations of one ligand, one receptor. And to do that, usually, it takes a lot of computer time. If you are in a situation in which your target is particularly flexible, one trick to handle this is to have multiple uh, confirmations of your, of your target and dock your library against every single pose of your receptor uh, conformational space. But this means that you're going to need way more power because uh, you're basically repeating the same virtual screening over and over for every single target structure. So. What we're going to, to do this, we're going to use Raccoon. So Raccoon will try to simplify this, this, this whole process, especially because we're going to use Vina. So for example, the maps that need to be explicitly calculated, but all these processes need to be done, at least behind the scenes, for you to, to be able to analyze the results. So if you really need a lot of computer power, there is this project that we try to advertise a lot. Um, actually, we have this project, but uh, it's open for submissions from everybody. We have this collaboration with IBM that's called uh, World Community Grid. Basically, they provide free computer time, and people around the world can download a screensaver. And while their computers are idle, and the screensaver is running, and you'll see this nice molecule with the uh, dots representing ligands being docked, uh, what, what's happening is actually your computer is using its spare time to run calculations for us, or at least for our project or the other projects in the World Community Grid, and it'll send the results back. So uh, the good thing is that you get billions of results for free. Uh, the bad thing is that you need to find out what to do with those results. So it's a huge amount of data. Actually, if your problem is too complex to be tackled locally, think about this, this opportunity. It's free. They give the computer power to everybody as far as you write a very simple proposal, and they're very friendly. So we know about the target structure. We know what we are looking for. But the, where do we look for the answer? So the answer lies in the chemical space. The chemical space is an abstract concept, is uh, an estimated uh, virtual space containing all the possible combinations of known atoms in the universe that can define uh, stable structures. So just to give you an idea, in the average pharmaceutical company, they have in-house molecules. They are developed uh, during the years with uh, um, uh, combinatorial libraries and so on. They are in the order of 10 to the 6th, so hundreds of thousands of molecules. Uh, and to handle these kind of libraries, you can still do, if you have enough money, like uh, pharmaceutical companies do, you can still do a high throughput screening, meaning that for every target, they can screen 100,000 of compounds, actual experiments. But it's in, in general, it's a good practice to, to run a virtual screening. Uh, the amount of all commercially available compounds is one order of magnitude higher, and it can definitely only be tackled with uh, virtual screening, because uh, there is no way that somebody's going to run millions of compounds through a high throughput virtual screening. The whole possible space of virtual combinatorial libraries is even higher. It's uh, billions of molecules. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. And actually, that tiny little color thing is not even in scale, because otherwise, it's, uh, it's going to be a fraction. It will have been a fraction of a pixel. The estimated chemical space is 10 to the 60 uh, possible molecules. And uh, just to tell you just an idea about the numbers we were talking about. Um, what we're going to do today is just to stop at the third zero. So very, uh, very shameful. But uh, that's the best we can do in a, in a single day. But uh, the, the, the largest actual uh, high throughput, uh, sorry, virtual screening that has been done in 2012 stopped here. And uh, you can imagine that uh, there's still a lot of uh, space need to, that needs to be explored. And it, it's easy to understand that you can definitely not explore this space systematically. So you need to find shortcuts. So let's simplify the problem then. So what we're looking for is a, a hit. You do a virtual screening because you look for a hit, a molecule that shows some kind of uh, affinity to your target that's high enough for you to detect. So you're not looking for a molecule with nanomolar activity out of a screening. If you start from scratch, you want something that you are able to detect. That's the important thing. Eventually, 
what you do is you take this hit or a bunch of hits that you derive from that molecule or from the same chemical space or surrounding chemical space that, that can be optimized and you look for a lead. A lead is a molecule that's uh, very likely to be further developed to be a drug candidate. So depending on what you're interested in, uh, if you want to find a molecule that can be a lead, you, there are a little bit of uh, a few guidelines that you can follow. So first of all, it needs to be fairly simple in terms of chemical structure. You don't want something that's too complex to synthesize, so otherwise it's going to be a dead end because nobody's going to synthesize derivatives for you and uh, you only have that yet that it's uh, not going to be developed anymore. Uh, it would be good if the chemistry to build this molecule is simple enough for combinatorial chemistry, meaning that you can, you can do high throughput synthesis to, to build a lot of derivatives. And uh, you should try to avoid as much as possible chiral centers, um, stereochemical, stereogenic centers in your molecule. This because uh, every time you try to synthesize a molecule and there is a stereogenic center, uh, it makes things more complicated from the synthetical point of view. The other thing you want to look at is a well-established SAR. SAR stands for Structural Activity Relationship in your series. So if you find a hit, it is fair to expect, to expect that, and you do your, your assay, you find that that hit is confirmed. So there is some kind of biological activity. It is fair to expect that a, sim a similar molecule that you can test within the same assay should give you similar activity. Because uh, if you're right in terms, of, uh, in terms of the reasons why this molecule is active, it's binding in this, in this site and it's binding in this way. If I find a molecule that has the fairly same st structure, and it's predicted to bind in the same way, I should see the same activity. If something like that doesn't happen, you start to be suspicious. So ideally, you want to find uh, at least more than one molecule to bind in the same, in the same site to be sure that your prediction is, is right. So of course, it needs to have good ADMI properties. It's hard to handle this problem at the very beginning, but it's doable. You can use some filters to, to handle this thing beforehand. I'll show you how. If you want to make money out of it or you want to find something new, something that you can develop uh, even uh, in academia, you want to have something that's uh, favorable in terms of patents. If you find a molecule that somebody already found 10 years ago and it's been patented by this company, so you cannot develop anymore, anymore there's no point in rediscovering something that's already known. So we said about the, the reducing the chances of this molecule being not soluble and not uh, drug friendly, if you want. So, in the years have been proposed different rules. So the most famous of one is the, is the Lipinski rule of five. That is basically a set of more than rules to be called guidelines. It's a series of uh, advices that you can follow for finding molecules there that have drug-like properties. So, so what Lipinski did was to take all the FDA approved drugs at the time, that was in 95 or 99, I don't remember exactly, um, and analyze their properties. So he found that, it's called the rule of five, because he found that the, all the properties, the physical chemical properties of those molecules were multiples of five. So all the molecules didn't have more than five hydrogen bond donors, no more than five hydrogen bond acceptors. The molecular weight was within uh, 500 Dalton, and the log P was, the, the octanal water coefficient was below five, the ratio. And um, so, Another approach to, to handle the problem of the, of the virtual screening is to say instead of looking for big molecules, to look for fragments. I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of fragment screening, but basically what you do is instead of docking big molecules or screening big molecules, even actual experimental screening, you screen a fragment, a library of fragments. There are smaller molecules that have, uh, that have been analyzed by this company called Aztecs to find something that's similar to the Lipinski rule of five sub five to fragments. And, uh, and you can see that basically it's called the rule of three because, again, lack of fantasy, all multiples of three. Uh, the advantage of using fragments over molecules, over full-blown molecules, is because uh, is, uh, that you can, screen, you can cover more chemical space with smaller fragments than you would do with bigger molecules. And it's, uh, it's more convenient. The problem is that these rules didn't work out because people were applying them as rules. And the thing is, retrospectively, it's easy to understand what a drug is. But if you look for the chemical space and you try to find drugs following the Lipinski rule of fives, the only way to succeed is if you sample the entire chemical space. And that's not going to happen. So basically, applying these rules too strictly didn't lead to a single active molecule. Well, a single drug, actually. A few active molecules for sure, but not real drugs being um, identified by pre-filtering the Lipinski rule of five. So keep this in mind, because it's very popular. A lot of papers are talking about this, but you don't want to be too strict in applying these rules. So 
just to be just to extend to build up a little bit on this um, rules are the Lipinski rule of fires are very generic and they are covering the overall space of the of the drug like molecules but if you are looking for a molecule that has to be active in the central nervous system you want a molecule that's probably more in the lipophilic side because it needs to pass the blood brain barrier around the, the central nervous system the other way around if you're looking for something that's like a gastrointestinal antibiotic you don't want it to be distributed all over your body so it's better if it's water soluble it stays in your gastrointestinal intestinal tract and it gets excreted so it's up to you to find to understand when you want to follow the rules and when you want to break them. And if you are very strict in applying the, the Lipinski rule of fives, you're going to miss, for example, these three drugs. These are known approved drugs. So one of them is an antiviral blockbuster drug for HIV therapy. Vancomycin is the last resort antibiotic that's used when, when there are uh, many, in, in cases where there are many uh, uh, antibiotic resistance cases. And then the other one is paclitaxel. That's a natural compound. The, the last two are actually natural compounds. Um, that is another blockbuster for cancer therapy. So, again, be smart and try to apply the, the rules that are more suited for your target. So, this is something that's uh, still debated uh, in um, in the um, medicinal chemistry field. So, what is, what is a what is drug? What is a lead-like molecule? A molecule that can be uh, easily modified to be a drug, and then what is a drug-like molecule? That's a molecule that's uh, one step away from being a drug. So, ideally. You want to try to sample the chemical space that's, uh, that's covered by these circles. But uh, it's hard to tell because uh, everybody has its own rules to define what are the hard walls of, uh, of, this, um, of this particular subset of the chemical space. But the important thing is that you want to avoid the molecules that we said are going to be reactive or have problems. And that's, uh, that's a, a great advantage to start with. So what are the advantages of the virtual screening? OK, we know it's relatively cheap. It saves money, time. It's used to enrich linear libraries. It's a perfect tool to exploit the, the availability, high availability of chemical structures, uh, sorry, target structures that have been uh, determined with structural dynamics, crystallography. And uh, a good thing is that it, it allows you to tr test the drug ability of a given system when known drugs are, are, are available yet. So you have a system, you don't know if it's going to be druggable. You run a virtual screening and you have an idea. If a lot of molecules are sticking to a particular cavity, chances are that uh, it's druggable. Disadvantages. Uh, We've seen all the corners we need to cut in order to use a scoring function in a high throughput fashion for scoring um, multiple poses of multiple ligands. So the problem is that this scoring function is average, it's good in average, but it's not 100% accurate. So you want to take in mind, uh, keep in mind this. The other thing is uh, the results. Your results are going to be scoring function dependent. So every scoring function on every software has its own pros and cons. So there are known scoring functions that work better with uh, hydrophobic ligands, scoring functions that work better with uh, hydrophilic ligands. The best way to settle this is to, as David suggested, take your known ligand if it's available, redock it and see if you get what you expect. So not necessarily structure based is better than ligand based if the structure is available. Keep in mind this because there have been successful ex examples in which ligand based have been um, more successful than cases in which the structure was available. Uh, your results are going to be strongly dependent on the target you're using, the search method you're using, and the, 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 sub, the fraction of the chemical space you're going to sample. The other problem that doesn't seem like a problem but actually is, is that virtual screenings always provide an answer. So you're never going to screen a library and the result is going to be no molecules. No molecules are going to bind. What you get is a ranking. This ranking must be, uh, must be evaluated. So you shouldn't take this as the truth. You should always, um, you should always try to be critical about the results and see if it makes sense or not. So I'll just skim through this because uh, um, I don't want to waste too much time on this, and I don't know how much time we're gonna we're gonna spend. I prefer to spend some time in the practical part. But uh, if you have any questions at the end of the uh, the talk, please let me know. So to extend what David said, garbage in, garbage out. It is essential that you spend enough time preparing your input data, being the target or the ligand libraries. You want to get rid of the unusual atom types or uh, elements that are toxic. You want to start with reliable 3D geometries because we are not going to change the 3D geometries in the docking, during the docking. So what we do during the docking is just to change the torsions and try to place the ligand somewhere. But if your bond angles, meaning the angle between uh, between two atoms connected in a molecule are not 
right, they're going to be wrong in the target in the final structure. So you want to try to simplify your life, and you want to try to reduce this, the search. So try to build diversity sets. We'll see later on um, a little bit more about this. You want to try to use generic filterings like uh, lazy or fuzzy rules of five filters. You want to try to use target specific filters, as I already mentioned before. And uh, most importantly, you want to try to use all the information you have available about your specific target to uh, filter and analyze your results. So if you know that a particular residue is, is crucial for the activity in your particular target, you want to favor ligands that are interacting with that particular residue. You want to try to, to, to build a structure activity relationship. So if all the known molecules that bind to your specific target have a phosphate group or, or a sulfate group that is uh, negatively charged, and you have a molecule that's binding there with a strong negatively charged group, that's probably more likely to be true than a neutral molecule. Um, it is important that even if your molecule is not particularly rigid, it's not particularly flexible, you want to try to sample different conformations of your target because usually that's known to reduce the number of false, false negatives. So it means that you lose active molecules just because you didn't sample the conformational space of the protein. Again, use the reference compound whenever it is available. If that's not available, try to find, to exploit any structural information you have. Being waters consistently found in regions of the protein, being sulfate groups that are being found because they are additive used in a, in a crystallographic um, experiment, but they're consistently found there in all the proteins, in all the protein structures, and so on. And then uh, brace yourself because not always uh, you're able to find, uh, um, not all the targets are draggable, meaning that you cannot always succeed in finding a molecule against your target. So just a brief overview on the target structure. You want to inspect the structure that, uh, to be sure that there are no mesium residues, no um, um, modified residues. Uh, they are different than the, the, the wild type structure of the wild type sequence of your protein. You want to be sure that the right protonation states are in place. So there are molecules in which it is crucial that the um, carboxylic groups are protonated, not deprotonated as, as everybody would expect um, in general. Uh, check if the structure is being dissolved with the uh, alternate side chain conformations because sometimes we said that we're going to keep the receptor structure rigid. If there is an uncertainty on a given side chain, as always, as often happens in, um, in crystallography, you want to try maybe to model that structure um, with, a, with a flexible side chain, with a flexible residue. Um, keep an eye on waters and cofactors. So usually cofactors, you leave them where they are because it's hard to compete the, with a initial cofactor. But you want to be sure that the, the structure is correct and it's uh, properly uh, prepared with hydrogen and so on. Same thing with waters. The unknown waters, they are so conserved in crystal structures, they are part of the receptor. So unless you know what you're doing, you should maybe keep them there. Should, or if you are competing against a specific water, you want to displace that and be sure that, sorry, remove that and be sure that use that structural information to see which molecules, which ligands are going to overlap with that specific waters. So you want to prepare your ligand properly. This is a little bit more technical. I don't think you're going to be much interested in that. But just keep in mind that you shouldn't trust programs that prepare your structures. You want to be sure that you're using the right tool because uh, um, there are different ways of storing the chemical information, and this chemical information needs to be processed in order to get a reliable 3D structures. If you're going to dock a banana-shaped molecule like this that has a distorted geometry, I don't know if you can appreciate that, but trust me, this molecule is distorted, you're going to get the false positive. This molecule is not going to bind there because it doesn't exist in this particular conformation. So unless you know what you're doing and you know how to handle chemical structure, you should rely on tools that prepare the structures for you in an automated fashion and validate everything, uh, the final results, or you should rely on publicly available data sets. PubChem provides you 1D and 2D structures. 1D are this small smile string that can be used to generate structures. And um, even better, Zinc. Zinc is a well-known database that provides uh, molecules from commercially available vendors ready to be docked. They actually provide molecules prepared for autodoc already, so in the PDBQT format. They are not much up to date, but we have tools now to prepare the, the zinc molecules from scratch, so it's not a big deal. The good thing about zinc is that uh, chances are that the, if you find a hit with, within this library, this hit is commercially available. So you can go and find a vendor and buy down molecules. So you don't have to synthesize it. It, it, synthesize it. It is good for you because it means that it saves you a lot of time. Because if you find a result that doesn't exist or nobody knows how to synthesize, Basically, you didn't find anything. 
So which kind of filters you can use then to enrich your results? Once you did all the docking, we're going to discuss about this more in detail during the practical part, but just to give you an idea, the first thing is you look at the score. Every docking software has a different metric to give you the score. Some programs give you positive values. Autodoc, for example, gives you negative values in terms of free energy. Um, but basically, the first thing you look at is the score. So you do a ranking with the score, and then you go on. Another concept that's, uh, that's uh, very popular is the ligand efficiency. Ligand efficiency is actually calculated experimentally. So you do your assay, you have a molecule that has an, efficiency, an, um, an um, affinity of, I don't know, 100 nanomolar. Then you take that 100 nanomolar, you divide it by the number of heavy atoms. All the atoms are non-hydrogen atoms, and you get the ligand efficiency. Another way, another way to look at this is to basically measure what's the binding contribution of every single atom. So the, the ligand efficiency is uh, the energy per atom that you get, the affinity per atom that you get by this given molecule. Since we're not going to do an experiment, you can take the other score divided by the number of atoms, uh, heavy atoms, and you get the ligand efficiency of your binding. The other thing you can do, especially if you use Autodoc, this is not available in Vina, is to do some clustering analysis. You dock things multiple times, so you collect a lot of poses, and you try to focus on results that have consistency in the, 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 the number of times in which a given result is found. If you do 100 runs, and in 80% of the times you find the same pose, that's very likely to be the best sensor that Autodoc can ever find. Um, so the whole goal of this is to try to reduce the number of results you can analyze at the end. So instead of looking at the top 20,000, you look at the top 1,000 or top 500, top 100, and your chances of finding good results are higher. So this is a bunch of uh, now pretty old uh, references, but still very good about um, virtual screening. And they will give you, unless you're familiar with it, uh, they will give you a pretty good overview of what uh, virtual screening is and how it is actually done in the real world. 